competitions. And I have to tell you, by far, I, I've seen maybe about 25 films already. This, by far, has been my favorite one. Oh, I nice. was so taken by the story. Now, why is it that we know so much about the Queen Mum, but we really didn't know very much about the Duke? Yeah, well, I mean, for a certain generation, I mean, it's, it's, back, it's sort of back in history now, you know. I mean, he died in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. Um, and Colin Firth was talking the other day about the beautiful footage he was seeing off Elizabeth, his daughter, who was going off to Kenya on a royal tour, or maybe even her honeymoon. Possibly. Yeah, I think it was a royal tour. She a royal had tour. read about that too, yeah. Uh, and it's the most beautiful footage of a dying dad knowing he'll never see her again. Yeah. You and, know, and what and a beautiful relationship, really, that Elizabeth mm. and her sister had with her parents. Yeah. Well, I think it's a nice, you know, certainly for the story of this film, there's a nice dramatic contrast between the older Edwardian legacy of, you know, that strict George V was uh, yeah. very much a naval man and um, that kind of fatherly parental pressure of, what, I suppose, what people call the stiff upper lip or, you know, yeah, yeah. that authoritarian thing probably contributed to to the Duke of York's yes. Im impediment. And stuff. Exactly. And then, you know. Because I know from when I was at school, like my uncle was a stammerer and my cousin started, but you don't notice it as much now. It was something to do with, I don't know, this could be too much pop psychology, <laughs> but there was something to do with that generation of men mm -hmm. between the First and Second World War that sort of went into social shell shock and kept everything right. repressed in the relationship with their offspring. I don't know, yeah. that it just feels like it's part and parcel of that kind of Well, it's interesting because life. when, when you know, Lionel, your character gets together with him and they establish that friendship, and, and as he knows people, of course when you're more comfortable, you don't stammer as much, but when you're under the pressure, you know, and it's interesting that this story is for a man who's, you know, the world waited, uh, you know, with bated breath for his words, mm. that put so much more pressure on him. Yeah, well, David Seidler, who wrote the screenplay, um, he was a young boy during the Second World War, like a five or six year old. And George VI kind of became a hero to him because he, uh, David was a serious stammerer. Mm -hmm. And he used to listen to the king making the wartime speeches. And he, he could hear that this man was a partly cured stammerer because he could hear the thinking pauses and the breathing and the clicks in the throat yeah. but he thought if he can conquer this I can and uh, that's why he wanted to write this story yeah. because he went through various therapies during the 1950s um, and he, he was telling us a lot of this of course when we were making the film uh, and I, I'd always known the one about that most stammerers didn't stammer when they sang mm. And I couldn't, I, I said, why does that happen? And he said, because you're making continuous sound. The, the, the mental anxiety and dilemma that a lot of stammerers will get into is that once the breathing and the voice stops, it's the panic about, will I be, get, will I, I be able to, oh, I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> you see, because you're getting nervous, right? <laughs> will, I, will I be able to get onto yeah. the next consonant? Yeah, yeah, it must know. be very, uh, very And then pressure, people yeah. start doing therapy or sessions and then they go back into society and everyone goes, oh, I, I hear you work, working on um, your stammer yeah. with a therapist. <laughs> and the stammerer goes, yeah. You know, yeah. it gets worse and worse. Like exactly. It becomes this sort of um, curious yeah. anxiety s circle, you know. Your rapport with Colin is fantastic. The two of you were so great. What was it like the first day you were together and you had to do those scenes? Just the two of you, one-on-one, -on -one, the therapy It stuff. was a lot of fun because we, we, we had about three or four weeks where we knew we wanted to really investigate line by line uh, in a kind of analytical rehearsal period to find out about you know, how we could express their various class differences, mm -hmm. their cultural, their continental differences, what was the relationship between an Australian and, a, and, a Brit, and yeah. an English yeah. monarch at that point, you know. Yeah. Um, and w in the course of those rehearsals, we found that there was the potential for a very sly kind of sense of humour from both of them. 
Oh, Because yeah. it was always in the original script that one of Lionel's opening gambits is, do you know any jokes? <laughs> Just talk to me. Do you know what I mean? Let's not talk about stammering or yeah. diaphragms or whatever. Do you know any jokes? Yeah. And Colin more or less improvised in rehearsal. Timing is not my strong point, you know, which I howled at. I said, that's fantastic. It was a great line. And it's really nice to have that, um, the, the comfort zone of the testing that's going on yeah. between somebody who, who doesn't, or is not allowed officially to have people sit closer than five meters yeah. to him. Exactly, yeah, you very, know. very, it's so fascinating. Watching that yeah. kind of being dismantled, I think, is yeah. uh, intriguing enough. Can you still do a tongue twister for me? I'm a thistle sifter. I have a sieve of sifted thistles and a sieve of unsifted thistles because I'm a thistle sifter. That's amazing. You see, because <laughs> I can't even get through. <laughs> Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers. I That's know. pretty good. <laughs> that was, how do you do that? How because do you... it's 10 in the morning. If, I, you know, if it was late at night and I'd had a vodka or something, it always comes out. <laughs> Next time Obscene. I'll bring you a vodka for the, our yeah, next yeah. interview. Um, you also had Lionel's uh, diaries or journals apparently yeah. that became available, what, we just were, a couple days before the shoot? No, I think it was about two months, nine okay. weeks or something. Still, what a treasure Absolute trove. Absolute bonus because I've played real people before, yeah. some very celebrated, some completely unknown. So it's a diff different way that you look at them. And I thought, I will, I will have to invent Lionel Logue from the one photograph that somebody had managed to get to me, you know what I mean? But once these diaries came in, I could actually see his meditative late night brain of what he wrote down in his books. It's what he actually wrote down on the medical card when he, he first interviewed the Duke of York. You know, yeah. weak chest, um, flabby stomach, Needs diaphragmatic buildup. You know what I mean. Yeah, All yeah, of that, yeah. and that became. Just a little, little you. Things you could see it. how that guy's diagnostic brain worked, and also he would describe things in the palace. You know, there's a lovely shot at the end, but on the September the third, thirty nine, when the the war was declared officially by Britain against Germany, he'd written in, you know, summoned to the palace by the king, um, arrived and met whatever the name of the equerry was, Harding. Um, hung my gas mask up in the lobby and we just went, what? So we've got that little scene that yeah. people were already prepped. They had gas masks with them and the barrage balloons had already gone up in case, and there were air raid sirens that day. They yeah. feared that there, there would be aerial attack. Yeah. Amazing. In complete retaliation to the declaration. You know? Wow. Uh, very quickly, I just want to ask you, uh, we're going to hear your wonderful voice in Guardians of the Gaul. I know it's a whole longer title than that, but uh, you are an owl, and I've seen, <laughs> about, I've seen about 15 minutes of this movie, and it is spectacular. Oh, have you seen it uh, on the big screen? I did. Uh, Zach I've did a special uh, screening for us in L.A. It is wonderful. How do you get into the mindset of an owl, a wise owl that you're playing here? I've done a couple of animated films, and in Finding Nemo, I was a pelican. Yes. So I'm, I've, I'm sort of working my way, way up the bird family. <laughs> the great thing is, I mean, they showed, they sent me the drawing of this owl, and he's about that tall, and he's got moth-eaten, scrappy feathers, yeah. and he's sort of like a bit of a Winston Churchill kind of mentor to the young owl. So the idea of being able to find a voice for that really crazy little character, the way he'll appear on screen, you don't get to do that if you're doing a live action yeah. film, you know. Um, and it does. Uh, I know they've worked extremely hard because, you know, at the, the great animation period is now 12 or 15 years old. So the level of sophistication and one-upmanship in the artistry has become very exciting. And I think on this one they've... Uh, Exceeded. Uh, they've, yeah, they've, you know. Okay, my time is running out. I'm so sorry. But get your tux ready for the Oscars. You are totally going to be there this year for this film. You're fantastic in it, really. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time.